He further says that humans have an apparently universal need to stereotype each other. We decide that certain family resemblances are important and then look for evidence that justifies our classification system. At different times in history, different characteristics have seemed important. Our neurological development is programmed to fill in knowledge gaps with previously assembled codes of information. For instance, children not exposed to language during their critical period of development never learn to speak a human language. Studies have illustrated the malleability of this sort of tribal thinking. Americans surveyed in 1942 believed Russians were brave and hardworking. In 1948, the stereotypes had shifted to cruel and conceited. Tribal thinking is inevitable according to David Berube. Its criteria are always changing. It is encoded in human brain development, which can be very useful but also highly dangerous. Another book which uh, illuminates this phenomena is uh, George Lakoff's The Political Mind. Why you can't understand 21st century American politics with an 18th century brain. So what he suggests is that language gets its power because it is defined relative to frames, prototypes, metaphors, narratives, images, and emotions. Part of its power comes from its unconscious aspects. We are not consciously aware of all that it evokes in us, but it is there, hidden, always at work. If we hear the same language over and over, we will think more and more in terms of the frames and metaphors activated by that language. Cultural narratives and frames are instantiated physically in our brains. We are not born with them, but we start growing them soon. And as we acquire the deep narratives, our synapses change and become fixed. A number of deep narratives can be activated together. We cannot understand other people without such cultural narratives. But more important, we cannot understand ourselves, who we are, who we have been, and where we want to go, without recognizing and seeing how we fit into cultural narratives. What is at stake is the deepest form of freedom, the freedom to control our own minds. In that book, he suggests that all thought uses conceptual frames, which are mental structures of limited scope, presence of specific unconscious knowledge about the world. If one is unaware of one's deep frames and metaphors, then one is unaware of the basis of one's choices. Besides, the deep frames and metaphors define the range within which one's free will operates. One cannot will something that is outside one's capacity to imagine, according to Lehman. Free will can operate only on ideas in our brain. It cannot operate on ideas we do not have. Free will is thus not totally free. It is radically constrained by the frames and metaphors shaping one's brain and limiting how we see the world. Those frames and metaphors get there to a remarkable extent through repetition in the media. Cognitive science, by making us aware, at least aware of the alternative frames and metaphors, acts in service of extending the range of free will. Another uh, important book is Propaganda and the Public Mind by Chomsky. Uh, he deconstructs the manner in which public opinion has been formed to perpetuate the agenda of big business and the ruling class. He discusses prospects for building a movement to challenge corporate domination of the media, the environment, and even our private lives. In the light of growing inequality worldwide, Chomsky shows us how ordinary people, if they work together, have the power to make meaningful change. Ideas, information, and activism can make a profound difference in the 21st century. Chomsky says, the right way to do things is not to try and persuade people you are right, but to challenge them to think it through for themselves, hence liberating the minds from orthodoxies. Another crucial concept uh, is from uh, P. 
Pierre Bourdieu, the French philosopher, it's called habitus. So according to Bourdieu, habitus is a system of embodied dispositions, tendencies that organize the ways in which individuals perceive the social world around them and react to it. These dispositions are usually shared by people with similar background in terms of social class, religion, nationality, ethnicity, education, profession. As the habitus is acquired through mimesis and reflects the lived reality to which individuals are socialized, their individual experience and objective opportunities. Thus the habitus represents the way group culture and personal history shape the body and the mind, and as a result shape social action in the present. The habitus consists of both the tendency to hold and use one's body in a certain way, such as posture and accent, and more abstract mental habits, schemes of perception, classification, appreciation, feeling and action. Another crucial uh, thinker in this regard is Michel Foucault, uh, his concept of the regimes of truth. <clears throat> so what are the social, political and textual forces behind the creation of a specific habitus? Foucault's writings have offered insightful explanations as he has convincingly shown how people are unconsciously and unwittingly subjected to discourses of specific power knowledge regimes and how invisible such intersubjective networks are, yet how strongly can they influence everyday thought in the majority. Foucault claims that in every society the production of discourse, information, meanings and circulation is controlled, selected and organized according to certain procedures including selection, commentary and fellowship of discourse. He explains that when an idea appears before us repeatedly through different modalities, we are unaware of the prodigious machinery behind it which is diligently doing discourse selection and dissemination. One rarely encounters a society without its major texts, Bible, Quran, Bhagavad Gita, Tao Te Ching, Das Kapital, Magna Carta, Communist Manifesto, U.S. Constitution, Sharia law, or narratives and stories which are told, retold, and well represented in diverse domains. Derivatives of those texts are to be part of the commentary in well-defined circumstances, for instance, religious texts, judicial texts, literary texts. Cultural identity thus becomes a product of repetition and sameness. Over a course of time, not all areas of discourse are equally open. Moreover, a person must fulfill certain similarity conditions before he or she can be admitted in the inner discourse circle. Uh, the function of fellowship of discourse is to preserve or reproduce discourses intergenerationally and allow them to circulate well within a community. It functions through various schema of exclusivity. Uh, for instance, identity of TV analysts and the air time granted to them. Uh, interpretive acts take place within the context of power relations, whether of nation, family, gender, class or race, in a historical community. Each society has its regime of truth, its general politics of truth. That is the types of discourse which it accepts and makes function as truth. These general politics and regimes of truth are the result of discourse and institutions and are reinforced and redefined constantly through the education system, the media, and the flux of political and economic ideologies. Next Before is... Before you move to the next book, does he mention how you can change... Can you just put back one? The, um... So the general politics and how it's formed, does he go into how to change that if over time, you know, all of these truths have been created, 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 um, and then, you know, when people move in with their own truths and are, you know, other people who are, of, you know, like a subset, you know, who believe in a different truth, 
this will touch on how to introduce those other truths in order to change the kind of overarching general policy? Yeah, so he would argue for uh, diversity in discourse. The books which are challenged, the books which are banned, uh, should be part of the discourse so that people can have conflicting points of view. Uh, he, he has written uh, several books on the idea of freedom, uh, and, and several of them actually are available um, free. Um, just Google Michael Foucault on freedom, and you will find that. So op he offers a way of uh, thinking about these concepts and broadening our perspective and critical thinking and reasoning. And looking at, at the ideas in circulation uh, with a skeptical eye, because what he is saying is actually going on in all over the world. Right, because right now when we're looking at the types of discourse that our society accepts and makes function as true, so there's discourse that's not accepted, right. which other people would say you have to accept, like kneeling um, and not standing for the national anthem. Right. Um, but that's just not changing by <laughs> continuing to do the, the discourse that's not accepted. No, it's, so it's not like changing, but it is creating. To create a way to get it accepted by not just keep doing it, obviously that's not going to work, but other ways to kind of change that, make it an acceptable function. No, but when you look at uh, you know our current times in the United States, you see the women's, you see the women's march, uh, you also see that you know minorities are speaking out. Right now, the mass media, the you know mainstream media, might not be uh, representing those views. But when you go to libraries, you can find the diversity of opinion, which Foucault right. would say that you know it's not part of the mainstream discourse, uh, but it is available in in libraries. But they are fitting into the acceptable <coughs> type of discourse because marching is constitutional, you know, discourse that has been accepted. I mean, but it took a long time to get there mm -hmm. because before when they were marching, I mean, it would turn dogs and fire hoses on people. Now the women can march peaceably, mm -hmm. but it took people just continuing to march. Yeah, and I think that that dialectic, that uh, conflict thesis and the antithesis, they're going to create a new kind of synthesis, but it's good that all those concepts uh, those opposing viewpoints are actually happening in this culture. Mm -hmm. In many countries, uh, that might not even be possible right. under authoritarian regimes. May, may I quickly mention sure. another book that I think addresses, um, at least in part, your questions. Um, there's um, a school of um, philosophy known as the Frankfurt School that arose um, to try to understand fascism as it developed in the, the, the Nazi state. And one of the Frankfurt School philosophers is Jürgen Habermas. Some of his work is kind of dense, but he wrote a book called uh, Student Protest Science and Politics that I think is, is relevant to the theme of 1968. And one of the things that he says is, is essential for con con counteracting the way that ruling classes in capitalist societies that can dangerously morph into fascist societies, one of the ways to, to counter their dominance of communication and distortions of communication is by doing what we're doing now, creating spaces for democratic deliberation. Mm -hmm. Because I would, I would say that this is an example of authentic communication. You know, I'm not, I'm not here because the mainstream media told me to be here. I mean, I'm here because of the factors in my identity as a feminist, as a democratic socialist, because I understand the importance of democratic deliberation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for sharing. You had it depends on the systems, too. If the people sort the power structures that threat, people don't always allow this course of march. Like people got. People got shot tear gas when they tried to march for Orlando Castillo or Mike Brown and other foreign countries. People get shot tear gas when they threaten the regime, mm -hmm. corrupt regimes of government. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I think we should count our blessings to be in a country where we can do such things, um, you know, without getting killed. <laughs> so let's let's move on <coughs> and then see what transpires and uh, feel free to. And so th this is another book uh, which talks about why uh, and how human beings believe what they do. And Michael Shermer has written a lot on uh, 
on skepticism on uh, why people believe in weird things is one of his previous books um, so so idea is uh, he himself was once an evangelical christian he lost his faith largely as a result of his college studies of psychology and cognitive neuroscience and describes why and how we are hardwired to want to believe why religious and political beliefs are so rigid and polarized or why the other side is always wrong but somehow doesn't see it we just believe things and then make our world fit our perception in Shermer's view the brain is a belief engine predisposed to see patterns where none exist and to attribute them to knowing agents rather than to chance the better to make sense of the world. Then, having formed a belief, each one of us tends to seek out evidence that confirms it, thus reinforcing the belief, which is also called confirmation bias. We all do this even when we think we do not. It's not a peculiarity of the uneducated or the fanatical. We do it in our own political allegiances, in our religious faith, even in our championing of scientific theories. So in a nutshell, beliefs come first, <coughs> reasons second. Shermer also delves into the neuroscience of the believing brain. People with high levels of the feel-good neurochemical dopamine are more likely to find significance in coincidences and pick out meaning and patterns where there are none. Even for folks with normal chemical levels, there is a neurological upside to pattern finding. When we come across information that confirms what we already believe, we get a rewarding jolt of dopamine. So over the past 10,000 years of history, humans have created about 10,000 different religions and about 1,000 gods. He lists more than a dozen gods from Amun-Ra to Zeus. He also recounts his own supposed alien abduction experience. In 1983, competing in a race across America bicycle challenge, he rode 1,259 miles in 83 hours without sleep and became delirious with exhaustion. When his support crew finally intervened to make him stop and get some rest, he became convinced that they were all aliens forcing him into a mother craft, <laughs> the interior of the UFO. A good long nap cured him of his delusion. <laughs> if only things were that easy, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so here's another favorite, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Uh, he got Nobel Prize in Economics. Uh, so what he suggests is that a reliable way to make people believe in falsehoods is frequent repetition because familiarity is not easily distinguished from truth. Authoritarian institutions and marketers have also always known this fact. Yeah. When, you, when you look at uh, the First World War, uh, Americans were very skeptical. They, they didn't want to, want to go to war. And that's when uh, the you know, public relationing industry um, came to the fore. And uh, in a few months, uh, the public opinion had changed because of the propaganda they did. And the same thing happened uh, before the Iraq War. So here is, is, in a nutshell, we can, you know, <coughs> summarize. Human beings have been using religion and tribal and national identities as fronts for narcissism and power politics. Given the amount of resources that human beings choose to spend on technologies of violence intergenerationally, one has to wonder how the free will of individuals in each generation gets co-opted by the parents, priests, educators, and politicians to support such conflicts. So from a librarian's perspective, individual and cultural growth are inextricably intertwined with what is read, re-read, rarely read, or never read across cultures. When members of a culture, be they Jewish, Christian, Islamic, Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, Taoist, reread the same book for centuries, that can create a socio-psychological collective condition what I call cultural addictions. To put it differently, my view is that textual addictions or cultural addictions are a form of ego ethnocentricity and often a product of parochial political propaganda 
in such addictions are as widespread on this planet as textual abstention, uh, be it east or west. Uh, another concept which helps us understand this phenomenon is uh, stages of development. Um, Ken Wilber, in his book, Integral Spirituality, writes, as we look at infants at birth, they have not yet been socialized into the culture's ethics and conventions. This is called the pre-conventional stage. It is also called egocentric in that the infant's awareness is largely self-absorbed. But as young children begin to learn their culture's rules and norms, they grow into conventional stage of morals. This stage is also called ethnocentric in that it centers on the child's particular group, tribe, clan, or nation, and it therefore tends to exclude care and concern and books of those not of one's group. But at the next major stage of moral development, the post-conventional stage, the individual's identity expands once again, this time to include a care and concern for all peoples, regardless of race, color, sex, or creed, which is why this stage is called world-centric. Thus, moral development tends to move from me, pre-conventional egocentric, to us, conventional ethnocentric, to all of us, post-conventional world-centric. In the great developmental unfolding from egocentric to ethnocentric to world-centric and higher, 70% of world's population has not yet stably made it to world-centric post-conventional levels of development. And when you look at 70%, that sort of explains why uh, nationalistic fervors are so high, why humans spend trillions on weapons to kill uh, the next door nation uh, and people accept that. Why? Because they are at a stage of development where they don't know any better. They just follow the crowd. They follow the people in authority because they resemble them, because they have been programmed uh, to see the resemblances with that ideology and what is in their brains. I mean, which, which starts happening from the moment a child is born. Not that I uh, disagree with or don't accept that number of 70%. I'm just curious, how is that objectively measured when, when somebody, or when you say 70% of the world has not achieved this level of consciousness? I'm just curious uh, how, that, uh, how, how did that number? A friend, a friend of mine who was in the audience, he said, uh, you know, 70% is too low. I think it's 90%. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, I, so in other words, there's like a questionnaire that's been verified as being reliable, a reliable like, measure. He, one, he has uh, a measure of world. The state of the world. It's hard to survey the whole world, though. It's very hard to get a census of the whole world let alone the whole United States. No, no, but there, there are sociological research <coughs> programs which are doing that. So he quotes uh, some sociological research. So presumably there's some instrument. No, no, uh, and of course. Yeah. That, that can measure, that no. has, been, has been confirmed, that can measure such things. No, but a world-centric yeah. view rating where they say free, partly free, not free. And it's, it's a rough rating, but it... it you know, when you look at how they classify over 270 countries in the world, you, you get a good idea of where people are within this framework, where mm -hmm. countries are within, and governments are within this framework. Yeah, I think the United Nations is offering a lot of uh, sociological data. So here is uh, Mark Twain who offers uh, an insight which as librarians uh, we verify it every day and the insight is if you know a man's nationality you come within a split hair of guessing the complexion of his religion and when you know the man's religious complexion you know what sort of religious books he reads when he wants some more light and what sort of books he avoids lest by accident he get more light than he wants mm -hmm. we are always hearing of people who are around seeking after truth I have never seen a permanent specimen. I think he had never lived, but I have seen several entirely sincere people who thought they were permanent seekers after truth. They sought diligently, persistently, carefully, cautiously, profoundly, with perfect honesty and nicely adjusted judgment 
until they believed that without doubt or question they had found the truth. That was the end of the search. The man spent the rest of his life hunting up shingles, therewith to protect his truth from the weather. If he was seeking after the only true religion, he found it in one of the in one or another of the three thousands that are on the market. In any case, when he found the truth, he sought no further. So how do we bring it all together? What's going on? I mean, why people are burning each other's sacred books? Uh, uh, why have humans spent most of their lives uh, in tribal warfare? Uh, here is uh, one excellent explanation, which I resonate with a lot. It's from the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM-5. Um, that, you know, the, the symptoms are like he has a grandiose sense of self-importance. For instance, exaggerates achievements and talents, expects to be recognized as superior without commensurate achievements, sustainable genius, is <laughs> preoccupied with fantasies. Would you say sustainable? Genius. I mean, you know who said that, right? Trump, he said that he was a sustainable genius. Is preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, and ideal love. Believe that he or she is special and unique and can only be understood by or should associate with other special or high status people or institutions. Requires excessive admiration. Has a sense of entitlement. Uh, unreasonable expectations of especially favorable treatment, of automatic compliance with his or her expectations, is interpersonally exploitative, uh, lacks empathy, is unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings and needs of others, is often envious of others and believes others are envious of him or her, shows arrogant, haughty behaviors or attitudes. So this in a nutshell is, is the uh, history of international relations. Yeah. <laughs> 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 was there a name for like uh, these are all like my yeah, was that symptoms one or was that one disorder or yeah. all of them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 One of the, there are yeah. nine portfolio is called mm -hmm. cluster B personality disorder. Which one? Cluster B personality disorder. Oh, it includes all of that. Well, well, that that was a, that's a narcissistic personality. Right. right? So that's it's one of that's one of the disorders. There's histronics and there's a couple right. others, but that's uh, that was one. Okay. So. There's now an anthology by I don't remember the name of it by I think like thirty five or thirty six psychiatrists and that's Oh, oh uh, yes. About Donald Trump. Yes. yes. And the, the things that they see in him that are psychologically troubling, and yes. most of them say that he has an extreme narcissistic yes. disorder. Yeah, so we can talk about these things in New York City, you see. Uh, I mean, imagine uh, some conservative state down south. Uh, we might not be able to discuss all that. <laughs> so thank God for being in New York City. So here is another. Great Turkish poet Murathan Mangan on identity. Uh, to me, this, this insight is so relevant for our times. Identity is a concept of our age that should be used very carefully. All types of identities, ethnic, national, religious, sexual, or whatever else, can become your prison after a while. The identity that you stand up for can enslave you and close you to the rest of the world. And here is a great... Uh, critical thinker about international power politics, Hans Morgenthau. His books are translated into many, many languages. I read his book in Pakistan like 20 years ago. Uh, so what he said is, is very relevant to our times too. The human mind in its day-to-day -day operations cannot bear to look the truth of politics straight in the face. It must disguise, distort, belittle, and embellish the truth the more so, the more the individual is actively involved in the processes of politics and particularly in those of international politics. For only by deceiving himself about the nature of politics and the role he plays on the political scene is man capable to live contentedly as a political animal with himself and his fellow men. A 17th century philosopher, Baruch Spinoza, uh, he was way ahead of the times in the 17th century, 
Today, uh, th there is a book by Antonio Damasio, he's a neuroscientist. Uh, the book is called Looking for Spinoza. So what he says is that what he is discovering in neuroscience was anticipated by Spinoza in the 17th century. So this is what Spinoza said about the human mind. The decisions of the mind are nothing save desires, which vary according to various dispositions. There is in the mind no absolute or free will, but the mind is determined in willing this or that by a cause which is determined in its turn by another cause and this by another and so on to infinity. Men think themselves free because they are conscious of their volitions and desires but are ignorant of the causes by which they are led to wish and desire. Will and intellect are one and the same thing, for a volition is merely an idea which by richness of associations or perhaps through the absence of competitive ideas has remained long enough in consciousness to pass over into action. Every idea becomes an action unless stopped in the transition by a different idea. The idea is itself the first stage of a unified organic process of which external action is the completion. So the richness of association and absence of competitive ideas, uh, information, is Spinoza's, in Spinoza's claim underscores the significance of the information equation culturally induced information, socio-political, or personally acquired information, which is self-education. So this was quoted in uh, Will Durant's The Story of Philosophy, uh, The Lives and Opinions of Great Philosophers. We have five copies of that book upstairs. <laughs> uh, so there is, there is another idea of, of by Ken Wilber on free will, which is quite relevant when we think about the choices people make in different cultures. Uh, Worse, he can introspect all he wants, and yet he still won't realize this. He is simply a mouthpiece for a structure that is speaking through him. He thinks he is original. He thinks he controls the contents of his thoughts. He thinks he can introspect and understand himself. He thinks he has free will, and yet he is just a mouthpiece. He is not speaking. He is being spoken. Aspects of subjectivity and awareness are the products of impersonal structures and intersubjective networks, and worse, structures and networks that cannot themselves be seen by subjectivity or awareness, not directly anyway. The subject of awareness is the product of intersubjective networks about which he suspects little knows less. When the elections were going on, you could see the partisan minds on both sides, the mouthpieces, and, and they were paid to speak uh, like that, or even not paid, they themselves were so convinced. Uh, and when you look at the history of politics, I mean in the US, the red states have remained red for a very long time, and blue states have remained blue for a very long time, and there are very few swing states, maybe two or three. But the pattern of voting is the same, so, so the idea of being a mouthpiece is, is quite accurate in many ways. So choices and cultures, <clears throat> how individuals on all sides of the conflict with all their free will significantly choose the same kind of texts, mates, friends, enemies, politicians, priests and news for generations after generations. It is not evidence of free will but of ego, ethnocentricity and narcissism and self-deception in action. Where has this power of conscious deliberation and the power to have none otherwise, which is also called free will, been for centuries, I wonder, the narcissistic attachments to tribal texts and identities seems to weaken the power of reason. From a librarian's perspective, ethnocentric narratives in circulation will inevitably create an ethnocentric will, not a free will, in a significant majority. So can we evolve? Is there hope? Uh, so someone who is currently at a narcissistic stage of development like me, right? Yeah. <laughs> he or she cannot suddenly or spontaneously start making evolved choices in a sustainable fashion, which usually emerge at a post-conventional level without first having diligently done some kind of necessary and sufficient inner work. 
for the evolution of consciousness. So this concept of inner work is crucial uh, for, for growth in consciousness. Hence, moral responsibility cannot be properly conceived without first identifying the essential existing level of consciousness development, which in turn cannot be understood without fully describing the causal nexus, especially long term, at work within and without. In other words, among the many equally probable alternatives open before us, we do make substantive choices, but those choices are usually mediated by our personal and cultural unconscious. At the corresponding and the corresponding specificities of information in circulation and existing developmental levels, egocentric, ethnocentric, world centric or higher. So they are all at work in some very complex and unique way in each individual. So if anybody is aware of a Jungian psychology, uh, practitioners of Jungian psychology call the systematic effort to access unconscious phenomena as inner work. So to question one's own self, all things considered, the pressing questions I ask myself after years of education and more than half a century of living in the East and the West are, what do I consider true, good and beautiful and why? Are my intellectual, emotional, moral and spiritual choices merely a product of my race, class, creed, gender? sacred texts, nationality, sexuality, ethnicity, historicity, language, age, and the tribal propaganda I have invited? Are there unconscious <coughs> forces at work of which I am not aware? In what significant ways have I included and or transcended the sacred, canonical, and best-selling texts of my religion, nation, class, ethnicity, or language? Are my substantive choices a reflection of free will or simply that with which I am familiar and, and with which I identify? So here is another interesting concept, a room of one's own. You see, that we all individuals have this capacity to grow and evolve and come out of the propaganda that we have imbibed for centuries. Uh, Virginia Woolf uh, talks about this. When a subject is highly controversial, one cannot hope to tell the truth. One can only show how one came to hold whatever opinion one does hold. One can only give one's audience the chance of drawing their own conclusions as they observe the limitations, the prejudices, the idiosyncrasies of the speaker. So in so many ways, we all have a unique journey uh, in growth and development. Uh, and we might not be able to uh, discover the truth. So, but at the same time, uh, there's a great philosopher who said that, you know, he was praying that God give me striving for the whole truth is for thee alone. Uh, we might not discover truth, but there's so much mystery around us, but we can at least sincerely seek it. And if we don't discover truth, at least uh, we have made an attempt and maybe uh, inspire others to do so. So, information uh, is a crucial concept in growth and development. Uh, ideas uh, and very specific ideas. And when you study uh, the nature of information, what is DNA? It is uh, genetically transmitted information. Uh, what is propaganda? It is culturally induced information. And what is personally acquired information? It is self education, what we seek. Uh, in libraries, in bookstores, uh, when we read uh, and, and try to understand the world, our own selves. So it is also essential to think of these specificities of three types of information, biological, cultural and personal, simultaneously, because they are all at work uh, at the same time, along with the stage of development attained by the individual, in order to understand his or her values, choices, worldview and will as these informational specificities are constantly interacting at conscious and unconscious levels. So I'm getting my 23 and me done soon. <laughs> For instance, if some so individual... You're getting what? 23 and me. The, the, the DNA, the biological information. <laughs> so if some individual can... So there's an example of uh, the culture and information and personal choices. For instance, if some individual converts to Judaism in Mecca, where Jews are not even allowed, or embraces Jainism in Moscow, it is not because of culturally induced 
state-sponsored propaganda or information in wider circulation, nor due to influence of the acknowledged sacred, canonical, and best-selling books of those cultures, but most probably due to some complex interactions of genetic predisposition, and more importantly due to personal informational experiences of the individuals in question, and that's where the idea of the room of one's own is. That, you know, even if we are living in a propagandized environment, we can still seek truth on our own by making the effort, yes. I, I think there's another um, historical um, context that's important to a room of one's own because Virginia Woolf was a British feminist. Mm -hmm. And she, by saying a room of one's own, she was also sort of parenthetically saying, a writer's room of one's own. Mm -hmm. in, you know, she was writing in 1931, and she was struggling for the right to be to be taken as seriously as a writer as a male writer was. So mm -hmm. the room of one's own that room operates on on several on levels. Several levels. It's, oh, it's, it's, it's you know literally a room where she can go to to honor her writing process, but it's also saying she has the right to carve out a, a political space for right. herself. Right, well, absolutely. Uh, so, sacred books and violence. Uh, one culture's sacred book could be another culture's banned book, not unlike the notion that one culture's suicide bomber could be another culture's freedom fighter. So, Tamil Tigers, Taliban, Mujahideens, or Kamikaze warriors all exemplify the tribal, narcissistic, ego ethnocentric stage of development, enacted in correspondence with specificities of induced and reinforced information in the absence of opposing viewpoints. And that's why the phenomenon of banned books exists. That if the opposing viewpoints are there, people will start thinking in, in more complex ways, which the people in power do not want, <laughs> are often in service of power politics. So the considerations of power are intimately intertwined with information in circulation, and such considerations usually underlie the phenomena of banned or censored books, more so under authoritarian regimes. Um, I personally went to Saudi Arabia with two books, and luckily I was able to pass through. But the customs will confiscate if they find that somebody is bringing a book into that culture. I'm glad you got out of life. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just ask one question about yeah. that? Doesn't that show if if the customs officer had a world view, but is stuck in a country that has the egocentric view, or even even a us view of themselves, that then presents the situation where somebody has a world view who can be forced into a, a lower level of development. Mm -hmm. right. So how are they accounting for that in that survey where an individual can present as a world view? but they may be in a country that has mandatory military service. So they may be forced to fight and even kill somebody and present them as an egocentric view. Because that's what I was meaning when I said before, that somebody can say they have a worldview. The country itself politically may not have a worldview, but an individual can, and then are they falling into the 30%? Yeah. Countries and seventy percent. It it happened in in Pakistan for the last uh, in the last few years. At least sixty journalists have been shot because they they spoke truth to power and uh, and they had to pay the price. Many of them are in jail. Uh, so it it is it's very difficult. But I think the survey must have uh, used anonymous uh, elements. So people who are you know conducting the survey. Uh, they wouldn't want, I mean, people who are answering, they might not want to be known for what right. they have answered. Like in this, if you're bringing a book in, right. that person who works in customs, you never admit. Exactly. I have a question. Yeah. So about information, you say genetically, culturally, and personally. I wonder when, when uh, if we're not referring to books specifically, but, but like mentorship, is it like between culturally and personally, you know, where someone has acquired a particular knowledge through their own experience and then they're still offering it as guidance to another? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I'm not sure where it fits with your system of knowledge. No, I mean, the other person who's receiving that information, uh, he or she could not get it from the culture, so therefore you are offering it. Yeah, okay. So, which is a unique personal experience for that person. 
Sure, okay, that makes sense, yeah. Okay, so we have to, uh, we just have five more minutes. So basically what I wanted to uh, quickly talk about was uh, Huntington's uh, clash of civilizations. Uh, according to him, it is inevitable. All these uh, cultures, they have different sacred books. They have different traditions, histories, uh, values. So the clash of civilizations is inevitable. Uh, and uh, to me, uh, which is unfortunate to think like that, because I think there are uh, other ways of looking at uh, the clash of civilizations and one of them is uh, that all these sacred books that uh, Huntington refers to uh, they all have certain verses which talk about uh, the transpersonal stages of consciousness which Wilbur talks about in his idea of stages that beyond the world centric there are other trans rational transpersonal uh, uh, dimensions which human beings uh, have the potential to attain and the great mystics of all great religions have attained those development, uh, those realizations. Uh, so a person wishing to evolve spiritually and discern matters mystical has to spend a number of years practicing some kind of... Richard Dawkins, who is famous atheist, he was asked this question by Charlie Rose, if there is any question that you have not been able to answer in your science career. And he said uh, he has no clue what is subjective consciousness. Uh, it's on uh, YouTube, you can just Google uh, Charlie Rose and Dawkins. So Dawkins has written many books on atheism, a militant atheist, but he acknowledges that he has no idea what is consciousness and many great thinkers, philosophers, some of them were here, have talked about the hard problem of consciousness, that we can't really understand what's going on. But uh, according to mystics, there is a way to achieve higher states of consciousness. If you want to know if this data is real, you have to do uh, and follow the experiment, which is contemplation, and see for yourself. Of those who adequately do so, the majority report a simple conclusion. You are directly introduced to your true self, your real condition. Such meditation contemplative practices for evolving consciousness are offered in all major religions and act as a unifying thread among theistic and non-theistic religions. So in a nutshell, Wilbur would say, <clears throat> the mystics ask you to take nothing on mere belief. Rather, they give you a set of experiments to test in your own awareness and experience. The laboratory is your own mind. The experiment is meditation. The zikr of Sufism, shikan taza of Zen, divikut of Judaism, the prayer of the heart, vision quest of shamanism, Self-inquiry of Ramana, Vipassana of Theravada, Shien Kwan of Tian Thai, Centering Prayer, the Raja, Janana, Hatha, Karma and Kundalini Yogas, the vast and stunning panoply of the contemplative practices of the world's great wisdom traditions. The whole point is to remember, recollect and rediscover that which you always already are. The soul's duty in this life is to remember. So the Buddhist symmetry and Seti Patana, the Hindu Samara, Plato's recollection, Christ's anamnesis, all of these terms are precisely translated as remembrance. And so the soul that finally remembers all this and sees it however vaguely can only pause to wonder, how could I have forgotten, how could I have renounced that state which is only real state? This is Ken Wilbur in one taste. So uh, higher states of consciousness exist and this is a map which has, uh, you see different circles here. So as you are, uh, as you move away from the center, you see more and more development in a sense. Uh, as our knowing changes, so does our being. So knowing and being are intertwined. Uh, for instance, there are three ways of knowing according to Wilbur's system. Uh, the eye of the flesh, the eye of the mind, and the eye of the soul. So each uh, dimension discloses a different layer of reality. And as we move uh, beyond the, you know, beyond reason, which is called transpersonal, uh, the mystical dimension becomes available to us, and which is the the outer circle in all the great traditions. So all great traditions have a mystical dimension. And you find verses uh, in all the great uh, sacred texts, Quran, Old Testament, 
New Testament, Gita, Dhammapada, Tao Te Ching, Guru Granth, and Upanishads. And I will quickly demonstrate uh, how that database works. So the idea is that all these great sacred books uh, have a mystical dimension and many, many mystics have talked about that. Uh, Jalaluddin Rumi, every war and every conflict between human beings has happened because of some disagreement about names. It is such an unnecessary foolishness because just beyond the arguing, there is long table of companionship set and waiting for us to sit down. What is praised is one, so the praise is one too. Many jugs being poured into a huge basin. All religions, all this singing, one song. The differences are just illusion and vanity. Sunlight looks a little different on this wall than it does on that wall, and a lot different on this other one. But it is still one light. We have borrowed these clothes, these time and space personalities from a light. When we praise, we are pouring them back in. And the last one that I would like to read before I demonstrate the database uh, is <clears throat> from, uh, Jalal, uh, from Ibn Arabi, another Islamic mystic. O oh, marvel, a garden amidst the flames, my heart has become capable of every form. It is a pasture for gazelles and a convent for Christian monks and a temple for idols and the pilgrim's scholar and the tables of the Torah and the book of the Quran. I follow the religion of love. Whatever way love's camels take, that is my religion and my faith. That is Ibn Arabi.